so hello everyone. Welcome to this presentation on adaptive pattern modeling for large reflector antennas. My name is Ramonika Sengupta. In this presentation, I'll be addressing three main questions. First, why we have proposed pattern modeling in this work? What is pattern modeling and how we can apply it to improve the performance of interference canceling in radio astronomy? Now, starting with the first question, why we have proposed pattern modeling in this work? I'll start by briefly in, uh, introducing the satellite interference problem. Interference from transmitting satellites is a growing problem in radio astronomy. This figure shows the satellite interference problem. Here we have a satellite traversing this antenna pattern and interfering with the signal of interest such that the output of this ground antenna has the signal of interest S, the noise N, along with an unwanted signal from the interferer Z. Now, this problem is particularly acute for LEO satellites due to their large number in the orbit. Currently, it is managed by scheduling, avoidance, or by deleting the afflicted data. Now, due to increasing number of satellites in the orbit, more sophisticated techniques will soon be required for mitigating interference because it might become difficult to avoid this problem by scheduling observations or there may be too much data to delete. Time domain cancelling is one such technique discussed in this work. This is a block diagram for time domain cancelling or TDC. Here we have the signal from the antenna X. This is compared to a reference signal D, which contains the best possible information on the interference Z. The comparison is used to get an estimate of the interference Z hat, which is subtracted from X to give the output Y. Now, ideally, this process should completely remove the interference. That means Z should be equal to Z hat while preserving the signal of interest and the noise. Now, I'll explain the state of the art in TDC and its limitations. The estimate interference waveform block here estimates interference in a certain time tau which in the existing work ranges from hundreds of microseconds to tens of milliseconds. Interference waveform characteristics are assumed stationary over this time tau. This is the state of the art in TDC. Now, for LEO satellites, the antenna pattern varies at a time scale comparable to this value of tau. This figure gives an idea of how the antenna pattern varies when a LEO satellite is traversing it. This is the magnitude of the antenna pattern for uh, an axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector with diameter 18 meter, focal ratio 0.4, and operating at a frequency of 1.5 gigahertz. This is the reflector that we have considered throughout this work. The satellite overhead has an apparent angular speed of 0.55 degrees per second. Now, since the interference is observed through the antenna pattern, this variation in the antenna pattern appears as variation in the interference waveform. Now, if we assume stationarity of the interference waveform, if the parameters vary by less than 1% in time tau, we observe here that the pattern magnitude changes by 1% in approximately 9.1 milliseconds at this minus 3 dB point. So this is comparable to, or in certain cases could be less than the value of tau assumed in the past work. This is the limitation in the state of the art in TDC. Now, this problem of pattern variation can be solved by correcting it at the input of the estimation block. But the problem with this approach is that the antenna pattern for large reflectors is not known accurately, and it is potentially varying with time due to mechanical variations. Now, since this true pattern is not known accurately, and it is also difficult to measure or analyze it, we need sufficiently accurate pattern models that can be implemented in the scheme. So this is where adaptive pattern modeling comes into picture. So in this work, in order to solve the problem of uh, lack of pattern knowledge, we have proposed adaptive pattern modeling, where we develop a parameterized model phi for the true pattern phi twiddle, and then adaptively correct phi to match phi twiddle using measurements of the interferer in real time. So this is what adaptive pattern modeling is. Now, how do we apply it to TDC? We can use the model pattern phi in lieu of true pattern phi twiddle at the input of the estimation block as shown here. 
Uh, with this approach, tau is now limited to the variation in the ratio of the true pattern and the model pattern, as opposed to variation in just the true pattern, which is comparatively larger. So in this work, we have developed methods for modeling the pattern of axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector antenna systems. Now, in order to determine the efficacy of the methods that we developed for pattern modeling, we have used two indicators. First is error in the pattern model with respect to the true pattern. This should obviously be negligible for a good pattern model. And second is pattern value update period, tau a. Uh, we define this as the time required to achieve a specified level of residual interference when used in TDC. This uh, specified level of residual interference that we have used is minus 30 dB at the half power point or minus 3 dB point in the main lobe. So in other words, tau a is the time uh, required to achieve minus 30 dB or 0 0.001 in linear units, residual interference at the minus 3 dB point in the main lobe. Um, note here that tau a should be greater than tau. Uh, this means that the rate at which the estimation block should be estimating interference should be uh, smaller than the rate of change of uh, pattern value update. Or in other words, we can say that in order to improve the performance of TDC, we can either try to increase tau a or decrease tau. We try to increase tau a by improving the pattern model. So summarizing these two points, error in the pattern model decreases with improving pattern model and pattern value update period tau a increases with improving pattern model. So um, now that I have explained the problem statement, I'll outline the methodology of pattern modeling and also highlight the results. Um, we start by uh, getting a closed form expression for the antenna pattern. This is a parameterized model with parameters accounting for focal ratio and feed pattern for the reflector system. This figure shows the comparison between the true pattern shown by the red line and the pattern obtained from this uh, first method shown by this green dashed line. We're calling it uncorrected model because adaptive correction has not been applied to it yet. Uh, so, uh, in the first method, we get a closed form expression for the antenna pattern. This is a parameterized model with parameters accounting for focal ratio and the feed pattern for the reflector system. This figure shows the comparison between the true pattern and the uncorrected uh, model. We're calling it uncorrected model because uh, this adaptive correction has not been applied to it yet. Next, we estimate the error in this pattern model with respect to the true pattern. This table shows the error at various regions at the peak of the main lobe and within the half power beam width and in the first side lobe. With subsequent modeling methods, we try to reduce this error obtained in the uncorrected model. Next, we observe the values of tau a. This table shows tau a values on the left of minus 3 dB point in the main lobe and on the right of minus 3 dB point in the main lobe. These uh, two, two columns correspond to uh, scenarios where the satellite is moving towards or away from the reflector pointing direction. Uh, note here that the values of tau a are different on either side and the estimation block in the interference canceller must be able to accommodate the possibility of the satellite moving in either direction. The major takeaway from this table is that the values of tau a have increased by orders of magnitude for the model pattern. Now we'll take a look at how the error and tau a values evolve with subsequent methods. The subsequent methods are adaptive pattern modeling methods where parameters of the models are calculated using measurements of the interference signals. Uh, these figures show adaptive pattern modeling methods with increasing order of complexity. The first frame corresponds to one point correction uh, where one measurement point is taken. The second frame corresponds to two point correction where two measurement points are taken. And these frames correspond to multi point correction. Uh, this particular example corresponds to practical scenario where the number of points increase with increasing time uh, as the satellite traverses the pattern. In this particular case, the satellite traverses the peak of the main lobe. Now we'll compare these corrections on the basis of their errors. This table shows the maximum error and its location within the half power beam bit and in the first side lobe for all these corrections. Now consider the first frame that shows one point correction uh, 
or p is equal to 1 with one measurement point in this uh, fifth side lobe. Uh, from this table, we can see that p is equal to 1 yields a better fit than p is equal to 2, uh, both in the main lobe and in the first side lobe. Then from p is equal to 2 to p is equal to 5, there is some marginal uh, change or uh, decrease in the error. A significant improvement in the error is uh, observed for p is equal to 6 and p is equal to 7. That is, once the constraint point includes the first side lobe and the main lobe, for p is equal to 7, which has one constraint point in the main lobe, in this case, multipoint correction is better than p is equal to 1 correction. So barring p is equal to 1, uh, we observe that the error decreases with increasing number of measurement points. Uh, I'll explain more on these results later on during the presentation. Uh, next, we observe the values of tau a for these plots. Uh, I'll explain how these plots were generated later on during the presentation. We obtain the values of tau a from these plots. Uh, this table shows the values of tau a for all these corrections. Uh, again, we observe that p is equal to 1 yields a better model than p is equal to 2 in this case, because the values of tau a are larger. Then tau a generally increases from p is equal to 2 to p is equal to 5. Uh, for p is equal to 6, that has one measurement point in the first side lobe. We observe that the values of tau a are similar to those obtained for p is equal to 1. And for p is equal to 7, uh, where we have one constraint point in the main lobe, here tau a values are the largest. So again, barring p is equal to 1, we observe that the tau a values increase with increasing number of uh, constraint points, um, so indicating an improvement in the pattern model. So now that I have given highlights of the main results, I'll explain the technical details behind them. First, I'll give you the organization of the rest of the presentation. I'll start by defining the true pattern of a large axisymmetric paraboloid reflector antenna. This is required as a baseline for adaptive pattern modeling methods. Next, I'll explain characterization of the satellite interference problem uh, and also discuss the adverse effects of pattern variation on TDC. Then I'll explain a new method for obtaining a closed form expression for the antenna pattern. Uh, then I'll explain the parameterization for the pattern model for adaptive pattern modeling. And finally, demonstration of the use of the developed pattern models to improve performance of TDC. Now, starting with the first topic, that is true pattern of a large axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector antenna. As I mentioned previously, the reflector that we have used has a diameter of 18 meter, focal ratio 0.4, and operates at a frequency of 1.5 gigahertz. This figure shows the cross-section for the reflector system. Uh, we have considered a Huygens source as the feed. The reason for selecting the Huygens source is to eliminate the cross-polarized component in the reflected electric field. So we only have the co-polarized component. Uh, the antenna patterns for this reflector system have been obtained using physical optics. This plot shows the co-polarized pattern, its normalized magnitude and its phase with respect to angle from the reflector axis, that is uh, theta. For adaptive pattern modeling methods, we have used this uh, pattern as the true pattern. Now, moving on to the next topic, that is characterization of satellite interference problem. Interference is expected to arrive due to satellites in LEO, MEO, and GEO orbits. Uh, out of these, LEO satellites are of a greater concern to radio astronomy due to their large number in the orbit. So for this reason, we have considered three LEO satellites, namely Iridium, OneWeb, and Starlink as representative cases. This plot shows the number of satellites with minimum elevation of 30 degrees on 7 November from Blacksburg. The reason for selecting a minimum elevation of 30 degrees is to uh, account for possible obstruction due to buildings and trees and terrain. Now, from this data, we get the mean number of satellites for each constellation. For Starlink, the mean number of satellites are around 93. For OneWeb, they are around 22. And for Iridium, they are around 3. The mean number of satellites is used to calculate the probability of appearance of these satellites in the antenna pattern. Now, satellites appearing in the main lobe are of greatest concern because this region is the most vulnerable to satellite interference. 
and also the directivity is greatest here. However, significant interference is possible from lobes around the main lobe. So for this reason, we have defined a central pattern, which consists of um, the main lobe and five side lobes in, on each side. The width of the central pattern is approximately 12.6 lambda by d. This table shows the probability of at least one satellite appearing within the half power beam width and in the central pattern for reflector diameters of six meter, 18 meter and 100 meter. From this table, we can see that the probability of at least one satellite appearing in the half power beam width ranges from 10 raised to power minus seven to 10 raised to power minus four. And that in the central pattern ranges from 10 raised to power minus five to 10 raised to power minus one. So presently these numbers are quite small, but they are expected to increase uh, due to increasing number of satellites in the orbit. For instance, Starlink and OneWeb anticipate adding approximately 40,000 more satellites. If this comes to pass, probability of having at least one satellite in the central pattern will be approximately one, at least for the six and 18 meter reflector diameters. So from this analysis, we conclude that the present day techniques of uh, deletion or avoidance will not suffice and more sophisticated techniques like TDC will be required. But the performance of TDC is limited by fast pattern variation resulting from high apparent angular speeds of uh, Leo satellites. To uh, know how the performance of TDC is limited, we, calculate, we need to calculate the pattern variation with time. To get the pattern variation with time, we calculate the apparent angular speeds of the considered satellites. Uh, these plots show the apparent angular speeds for the considered satellites calculated using their azimuth and elevation angles. Along with this, we have also estimated the maximum apparent angular speed for the satellites. Uh, this is the apparent angular speed when the satellite is exactly overhead or at the zenith. In this expression, H is the altitude of the satellite, RE is the radius of the Earth, and T is the orbital period of the satellite. This estimated apparent angular speed has been shown by these red arrows here. <clears throat> In all these cases, we observe that this number gives an approximate upper bound to the apparent angular speed. Um, now to get the pattern variation with time, uh, we, we have used the apparent angular speed, the estimated apparent angular speed of iridium, that is 0. 0.55 degrees per second as the representative case. So for a satellite overhead with an apparent angular speed of 0. 0.55 degrees per second, and the reflector assumed to be pointing towards the zenith, this is the pattern variation with time. The satellite traverses the central pattern in approximately 14.6 seconds. These plots show the rate of change of magnitude and rate of change of phase for, of the antenna pattern. From these plots, we can observe that the phase changes at a much slower rate compared to the magnitude. Uh, for instance, if we compare the numbers at this minus three dB point, we observe that the rate of change of phase is 1.18 per second, whereas the rate of change of, uh, sorry, the rate of change of magnitude is 1.18 per second, whereas the rate of change of phase is approximately three orders smaller. So from these plots, we can say that uh, change in phase is negligible compared to the change in magnitude. So now that we have the pattern variation with time, or more specifically, the magnitude variation with time, we calculate the pattern value update rate uh, for interference canceling. Uh, here we have derived an approximate expression for the desired tau as a function of diameter of the reflector, the wavelength, angle from the reflector axis and apparent angular speed. This expression is valid only for the main lobe or more specifically for theta less than approximately 1.15 theta HP. Theta HP being the half, half power point or minus three dB point in the main lobe. In this expression, IUB is an upper bound on the leftover interference bar after interference canceling relative to the interference bar at the input of the interference canceller. Now, assuming that this leftover interference in the signal is entirely due to pattern variation in the time tau, this is the expression for IUB. In this expression, one minus psi is the fractional change in pattern over time tau. From this table, we can see that for 3% fractional change in pattern, IUB is limited to minus 30 dB. 
For 10%, IUB is limited to minus 20 dB, and for 31%, IUB is limited to minus 10 dB. For these three values of IUB, this plot shows the uh, time tau with respect to the angle from the reflector axis theta. Now, from this plot, we observe that the value of tau decreases with increasing theta and increases with increasing IUB. The value of tau at theta limb, that is 1.15 theta HB, is on the order of uh, tens of milliseconds for IUB minus 20 dB and approaching a few milliseconds for IUB minus 30 dB. So this analysis implies that if the time for estimating interference is large, then there will be more leftover interference in the signal, even after canceling uh, due to the pattern variation during that time. Now, substituting theta HP in this expression for tau, we get this expression for tau A, or the pattern value update rate, which I defined in the introduction slides as uh, the time required to achieve a specified level of residual interference at the minus 3 dB point or half power point. Uh, from this plot, we can see that tau A decreases with increasing d by lambda ratio. So for a 100 meter reflector operating at 10 gigahertz frequency, tau A is no more than 10 milliseconds for IUB minus 10 dB and approaches approximately 1 millisecond for IUB minus 30 dB. So the lessons learned from the satellite interference problem are that if tau cannot be reduced to accommodate tau A, then IUB will be limited. To improve the performance, the pattern variation should be if, uh, considered in the design of the canceller. So assuming that the pattern is constant for larger than tens of milliseconds can significantly limit the performance of interference canceling for LEO satellites. A possible remedy is to correct the signal at the input of the canceller, but that requires the pattern information, which may not be possible to, uh, to obtain. So in this work, we have devised methods to develop sufficiently accurate models for the true pattern. Now I'll, uh, this, uh, so now I'll explain the pattern modeling methods. First, we need a closed form expression for the antenna pattern. To get a closed form expression, we consider the reflected electric field when the antenna is transmitting in a plane perpendicular to the symmetry axis or Z axis. This is called the aperture plane and is assumed to be a circular physical aperture. The aperture electric field is assumed to have this form. The field has a parabolic on a pedestal distribution of here, where C is the pedestal height or edge illumination and N determines the specific distribution such that N is equal to one corresponds to parabolic distribution. N is equal to two corresponds to parabolic squared distribution and N is equal to zero corresponds to uniform illumination. Now for this electric field distribution, this is the closed form expression for the normalized pattern function obtained from Stutzman and Thiel. Uh, in this expression, f function of theta and n uh, given by this expression is the normalized pattern function for zero edge illumination. Uh, in this expression, only integer values of n are considered because of the presence of this n plus one factorial term. In our extended method for practical reflector systems, we have assumed a cos-q feed model. The reason for this assumption is that this feed uh, is uh, known to be a representative of a broad class of feeds used in this application. And also the associated parameters to get the closed form expression are relatively easier to calculate. The edge illumination C is calculated from the ratio of electric field incident from the feed at the rim of the reflector relative to the field incident on the vertex. Then the parameter N is estimated from C and the taper efficiency. Uh, in our extended method, we have accommodated non-integer values of N in the closed form expression for the normalized pattern function. Now I'll explain the procedure for a fast approximate prediction, uh, for a fast approximate method to predict the normalized pattern function. All the equations on this slide have been taken from Stutzman and Thiel. We start by calculating the angle to the rim of the reflector that is theta naught given by this expression. The edge illumination C is calculated from the ratio of electric field incident from the feed at the rim relative to the field incident on vertex. 
The parameter Q for the assumption of a cos Q feed is calculated from C using this expression. Then we calculate the spillover efficiency and aperture efficiency with the parameter Q. Uh, these are required to calculate the taper efficiency, uh, which is the ratio of aperture efficiency and spillover efficiency. Uh, then finally, we calculate the parameter N by numerically uh, solving this equation, uh, which contains the taper efficiency and C. So now that we have all the required parameters, we substitute them in these expressions. This is the same expression for the normalized pattern function that was given in the previous slide. Uh, to accommodate non-integer values of n, we have replaced the n plus one factorial term with this gamma function. So now that we have a closed form expression for the pattern function, we plot it and compare it to the normalized pattern obtained from physical optics. Uh, from this plot, we can see that the approximate method yields a good fit for the normalized pattern. Along with this, we also compare the values of gain, half bar beam width and side lobe level. Uh, the gain for the approximate method can be calculated using this expression that contains the aperture efficiency, which can be calculated using the expression given in the last slide. The half bar bandwidth and uh, sorry, the half bar beam width and the side lobe level may be determined from the normalized pattern. So from this table and from this figure, we can say that a good agreement has been obtained between the pattern obtained from physical optics and the approximate method. In the next slide, I'll explain parameterization of this normalized pattern function for adaptive pattern modeling. The pattern functions, uh, these two pattern functions corresponding to uh, zero edge illumination will be used for adaptive pattern modeling. So now I'll explain the parameterization of the obtained pattern function. This is the same expression for the normalized pattern function obtained from the previous slide. Uh, now we replace these coefficients of these pattern functions by A0 and V0. A0 and V0 are real valued because N and C are real valued and they are independent of theta. Uh, next, we write the model pattern expression by replacing A0 and V0 with A and B. Using measurements of the true pattern, that is phi twiddle, we calculate A and B to correct the model pattern phi. In this expression, A and B are complex valued coefficients because phi twiddle is complex valued and they account for phase and differences in gain and shape of phi twiddle. First, we will compare the uh, pattern obtained from the approximate method with the true pattern. This is the pattern function obtained for the approximate method. This is obtained by multiplying this expression with square root of gain to get the unnormalized pattern function. Uh, this figure shows the uh, comparison between the true pattern and the uncorrected model. This is the same uncorrected model from the introduction slides. And this table shows the error in the magnitude at the peak of the main lobe and within the half power beam width and the first side lobe. With subsequent adaptive pattern modeling methods, we try to reduce this error in the uncorrected model. Now I'll explain the adaptive pattern modeling methods with improving order of complexity. Starting with one point correction. Um, in one point correction, we have one measurement of the true pattern and we solve for two unknowns A and B. This is an underdetermined system. So multiple solutions for A and B are possible. Uh, we have tried these two solutions. Now we compare these solutions. We first apply one point correction to the peak of the main lobe. And we observe that in this case, both solutions give a reasonable pattern model. However, if we apply correction to some other point on the pattern, say uh, for example, the peak of the first side lobe, we observe that only the second solution gives a reasonable pattern model, whereas the first solution deviates drastically. So from this point, we have used the second solution for one point correction. These plots show the one point correction applied to the peak of the main lobe and peak of the first side lobe. And this table shows error in the magnitude for the uncorrected model and one point correction with a constraint point taken at the peak and peak of the first side lobe. Uh, from, the, from the uncorrected model, we can observe that the error has reduced uh, substantially. Next, we apply one point correction to other points on the main lobe and other points on the side lobe. 
uh, we observe that as the point is selected away from the peak of the main lobe, the error in the main lobe increases. And the same trend is observed in the side lobe. That is, as the point is selected away from the peak of the side lobe, the error in the side lobe increases. Overall, we can say that one point correction improves the pattern model as compared to the uncorrected model as it gives lesser error. So after one point, we have two point correction where we have two measurements of the true pattern and we solve for two unknowns A and B. This is a well-determined system and, and we get a unique solution for A and B. Now we apply two point correction to two points on the pattern, the peak of the main lobe and the half power point or minus three dB point. This table shows the error in the magnitude for this two point correction. Now comparing this to one point correction, applied to the same two points separately, we observe that the error has reduced specifically from 0.12 dB to 0 0.00 dB, rounded off to the second decimal place within the half power beam width, and from minus uh, from 1.96 dB to 0.78 dB in the first side lobe. Next, we apply two point correction to the peak of the main lobe and peak of the first side lobe. Comparing this to one point correction applied to the same two points, we observe that the error has reduced from 0.66 dB to 0.06 dB and from 1.85 dB to 0.62 dB. Next, we apply two point correction to other points on the main lobe and other points on the side lobe. Again, the same trend is observed that as the two points are selected away from the, away from the peak of the main lobe, the error in the main lobe increases. And the same trend in the side lobe, that is, as the two points are selected away from the peak of the side lobe, the error in the side lobe increases. Now, summarizing these two correction methods, we can say that one point correction reduces the error in the pattern model as compared to the uncorrected model. And two point correction, or P is equal to two, further reduces the error in the pattern model as compared to one point correction, indicating improvement in the pattern model. After two point, we have multi point correction where we have measurements of more than two points on the true pattern and we solve for two unknowns A and B. This is an overdetermined system and we solve this linear system of equations for this matrix X containing the unknowns A and B. In this case, we get a least square solution for the linear system of equations such that X minimizes the error between the true pattern and the estimated values of the model pattern. So this is the solution for X. Now we apply multi-point correction, starting with three-point correction applied to the peak of the main lobe, the half power point and peak of the first side lobe. This table shows the error in the magnitude for three-point correction and one-point correction and two-point correction applied to the same points, one at a time and two at a time respectively. We observe that compared to one point, the error has reduced substantially for three point correction. However, the difference between the error and pattern for P is equal to two and P is equal to three is marginal. In fact, we can say that for constraint points selected in the main lobe, P is equal to two yields a better fit than P is equal to one and as good a fit as for P greater than or equal to three. However, for other points selected on the pattern, pattern model might improve with increasing number of measurement points as will be shown by the next example. Now, coming back to this example from the introduction slides, which corresponds to the practical scenario where the number of points increase with increasing time as the satellite traverses the pattern. I'll explain, I'll add a few more details to this. This table shows the error in the magnitude at the peaks of the main lobe and the side lobes. From this table, we can see that around the edge of the central pattern, that is where the points are selected, P is equal to two yields a better fit. However, within the main lobe and the first side lobe, P is equal to one yields a better fit compared to P is equal to two. And then from P is equal to two to P is equal to five, there is some marginal change in the error. Significant improvement is observed for P is equal to six and P is equal to seven. That is once the constraint point includes the first side lobe and the main lobe, for P is equal to seven, where we have one constraint point in the main lobe in this case, multi-point correction is better than P is equal to one. Now I'll explain the incorporation of the discussed model patterns in TDC. 
uh, this is the proposed scheme of TDC with pattern variation corrected using the model pattern. In this case, the uh, variation in the true pattern is reduced to the variation in this ratio of the true pattern and the model pattern represented here as zeta. So IUB now depends on the fractional change in zeta over time tau. We now calculate the values of tau a for the discussed pattern models. Uh, recalling that tau a is the time required for IUB to be reduced to minus 30 dB at the minus 3 dB point in the main dope. We compare the performance of the models by comparing their values of tau a. Uh, incorporating an accurate pattern model in this proposed scheme of TDC has an effect of increasing tau a. We first start by calculating tau a for the true pattern, that is when pattern variation is not corrected in TDC. We obtain the values of tau a from this plot. In this plot, the vertical axis shows uh, zeta normalized to the value of zeta at the minus 3 dB point. And the horizontal axis shows time with respect to time at the minus 3 dB point or half power point. Now, IUB minus 30 dB corresponds to 3% change in zeta. So these horizontal lines, horizontal dash lines correspond to plus or minus 3% change in the normalized zeta. Sorry, uh, in the no zeta value at uh, the minus 3 dB point. Now, zooming into this part, we get the values of tau a for plus or minus 3% change in zeta. These values of tau a are 26 milliseconds and 25.5 milliseconds. Comparing this to the value of tau a obtained from the analytical expression from for our considered example, we get 23.9 milliseconds, which is very close to uh, these values, even after like few assumptions were taken to derive this expression. Now we calculate the values of uh, tau a for the uncorrected model that uh, that is with the incorporation of the uncorrected model in the proposed scheme of TDC. We observe that the values of tau a have increased by orders of magnitude. Next, we will be using these values of tau a uh, for comparison, comparison of the other pattern models. Starting with one point correction applied to the peak of the main loop, the half power point, and peak of the first side loop. We observe in this case that tau a values have remained unchanged. A possible reason for this is that the for one point correction, the shape of the pattern remains the same, only the absolute values change. Next, we observe the values of tau a for two point correction applied to the peak of the main lobe and half power point and applied to the peak of the main lobe and peak of the first side lobe. We observe that there is some substantial difference in the values of tau a for two point correction. Uh, after two point, we have three point correction applied to the peak of the main lobe, the half power point and peak of the first side lobe. From this table, we can see that two point correction where two points are selected on the main lobe. Here we get the largest values of tau a. For other points, the tau a increases with increasing number of constraint points. So now I'll come back to, sorry, to this example from the introduction slides. Uh, this is the same example that corresponds to the practical scenario where the satellite is traversing the pattern. Here we observe that the values of tau a for p is equal to one are the same expected values of tau a obtained for the uncorrected model. And for the other corrections, tau a increases with increasing number of constraint points. For p is equal to seven, the tau a values are the largest in this case. Now I'll list the contributions of this thesis. In this work, LEO satellite interference problem for radio astronomy has been characterized. And it indicates that the present day techniques of managing the satellite interference by deletion or avoidance may not suffice. And they need to be replaced by more sophisticated techniques for interference mitigation. In this work, we have discussed TDC based mitigation of interference. The adverse effects of pattern variation on TDC based interference mitigation have been quantified. Uh, using the measure of maximum period of pattern function value update tau a. Uh, this, in, uh, this indicates that uh, for uh, irrespective of the size of the reflector or 
the frequency, presuming that the pattern is stationary for larger than tens of milliseconds, can severely limit the performance of TDC for LEO satellites. Thus, there is need for incorporating an accurate pattern model in the proposed scheme of TDC. The incorporation of an accurate pattern model has an effect of increasing tau wave. Uh, we, exp we have introduced an approximate closed form pattern model for large axisymmetric paraboloidal reflectors. A comparison of this pattern model obtained from the pattern obtained by PO confirms the validity of the model. Uh, we observe that tau wave for the uncorrected pattern model has increased by orders of magnitude. Then an, then an adaptive method to further improve the pattern model has also been discussed where model parameters are calculated using measurements of the interference signal. We observe that tau a is extended further over the non-adaptive method. Now I'll conclude with the summary of this thesis. In this work, methods for modeling the pattern of large axisymmetric paraboloidal reflector antennas has been, uh, has been introduced. The intended application for the discussed model patterns is to improve performance of TDC in radio astronomy. In the first method, we get a closed form expression. And in the subsequent adaptive pattern modeling methods, we improve the pattern model using measurements of the interference signals. The efficacy of the developed pattern modeling methods has been demonstrated by showing that the error in the pattern model decreases and the pattern value needs to be updated at a much slower rate for effective TDC. Thank you. <laughs>